Behruz Bouchani, an Iranian refugee on Manus Island, has won the highest literary award in Australia. And he's been on Manus Island for six years. And he really, you know, his, his, his book uh, that he wrote on WhatsApp, his words uh, accepting uh, the, uh, the prize, really uh, shows so much humanity vis-a-vis -vis the sort of brutality and barbarity that's been imposed on refugees by the Australian government. And you could see uh, there is a contrast here. And this contrast shows at the same time the dominant policy of all governments now all governments, irrespective, doesn't matter European, North American, Australia, everybody, is to create hell for asylum seekers and refugees. These are the best of uh, most of the societies who run away and they are resistant and the centers of those countries and they want to live better, that always have positive contribution. And, and the uh, policy of the uh, governments now is completely inhumane and you can see the situation they've created. Now they are creating concentration caps. Mm -hmm. This is the first one. Europe is planning to create concentration caps. Look at them, what's happening in America and, and the way Trump is treating the uh, refugees and asylum seekers coming over from southern borders and everywhere else. Um, and you stand, you know, Amazed, the, the level of brutality of this system is imposing on uh, on asylum seekers and refugees and immigrants. But at the same time, there is resistance every day against this situation. And of course, we know that it's become so brutal, especially after the end of the Cold War, because uh, at the time, during the Cold War, the West wanted to show that it was so much more pro-human rights than the Soviet Union at the time. And so refugee rights was respected. Lots of people were able to get refugee status. And after that, of course, we've seen the end of the right to uh, refuge and the criminalization of refugees as well. So that, you know, all we hear about is how people are illegal. But listen, people have no choice but to leave without proper documents. That's really what the issue is. They can't get a visa. Um, uh, from European countries, for example, and also they can't get an exit visa very often uh, by the governments that are persecuting them. So obviously they're going to have to leave in ways uh, that are not completely legal uh, without proper documents. But that's the, always been historically the reality of refugees. How do you think Jewish refugees fled uh, Nazi-occupied areas? It was the same way. Uh, you know, very often they were criminalized then too. European governments returned Jewish people to their death. And also people who helped uh, Jewish refugees were criminalized. We're seeing the same thing again right now. Uh, absolutely. And you could, you, you could see, uh, even when the uh, asylum seekers succeed in entering into the, uh, uh, the countries and, and claim asylum, they're treated not only as second citizens, but as non-existent citizens. The way they're treated, look at the whole asylum system in, in Europe, the way asylum seekers are. Uh, accommodated. They are deprived of the right to work. I mean, come on, you've got families uh, who, uh, you know, they can't, they can't live, they can't, they limited access to various services, they are uh, put in a substandard accommodation at the mercy of uh, unscrupulous uh, uh, accommodation providers, and they have to stay in that situation. Imagine families uh, staying for, for five, sometimes. six, seven, eight years in that situation with no end, and that destroys the life. Even those who are uh, um, immigrants and become so sort of regularized or the situation is uh, accepted, they're still treated as second-class citizens. And look at the Windrush generation in England. Mm. Even, um, you know, uh, Theresa May suppressing studies that proves that there's no negative impact of immigration on, on wages. And shamelessly, she goes to the Tory party conference and says, you know, uh, people who have low wages, uh, you know, it's understandable. People don't talk about it, but it's understandable why they feel aggrieved uh, um, um, because of the low wage immigration. I mean, and of course, you know, when you look at the situation of uh, refugees and asylum seekers everywhere, they are really the most vulnerable. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at uh, even just the numbers of people who have died trying to get into Europe, you know, one out of every 18 person has drowned in the Mediterranean Sea. This is a scandal. And then if people go to help them, they're criminalized. If they're trying to flee, they're criminalized. The Stansted 15 is a great case in point, you know, using counter-terrorism measures in order to imprison and criminalize people who are peacefully trying to save the lives of those who are being deported.
Absolutely, and you could see under the pressure of public opinion, the courts they've said although they've, they've condemned them on the anti-terrorism uh, act, uh, um, you know, under pressure of the public op opinion, they could not put them to send them to to prison, and that's important. At the same time, while there is all these measures, at the very same time, the resistance against uh, um, these immigration and inhuman conditions are growing every day. Mm -hmm. You'll see Bochani in Australia and her. Uh, Australian society, not the Australian government, Australian society is uh, uh, um, embracing. Yeah, there's uh, a huge China. campaign, isn't there, Absolutely. for uh, people to, for uh, refugees to be brought onto Australian a soil? A absolutely, and uh, on the other hand, it is support for Standard State 15, mm. uh, the situation of the Iranian asylum seekers in Turkey. Yeah. This is just an unacceptable situation, but at the same time, campaigns are starting to, uh, to defend them and try to put this right. But it's a struggle that is going to continue. Yeah, and even uh, one of the things that the Stansted 15 said, which I found really interesting, in front of the court, they said that, you know, what's happened to us is nothing compared to what happens every day to asylum seekers and refugees across the world, you know. So uh, they talk about the fact that uh, immigration officials go at midnight and try to grab people in their sleep, uh, they're detained, they're deported, they're beaten. One of the things Behruz Buchani talks about is the humiliation, you know, to be so humiliated only because you are not properly documented, you know, is really scandalous, it's outrageous, but it happens all the time, it's justified, it's legitimized. And of course, um, we know so many cases, you know, uh, there's the case of Faso Hadrizvi that you work on. Uh, absolutely. And, uh uh, Faso had was uh, he's been uh, um, placed in Swindon, um, and for uh, last week, where the temperature dropped below zero, he, he him and his family, we've got two children of two, uh, four year old and twelve year old, were left with no heating and and hot water in that temperature for days, for, for, days. for days and yeah. days, three or four days, yeah. and it was only through uh, Twitter and, and and pressure on the um, on local government, which we did nothing at all. Uh, we we managed to. Um, a force action after four or five days by the accommodation provider to come and uh, uh, temporarily resolve the issue. But this is a situation of so many asylum-seeking mm -hmm. families mm -hmm. who put in temporary accommodation. The, 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 the right to work has been taken away from them. The life, the normal life has been taken away and, and effectively put in uh, um, a situa uncomfortable situation to deter people uh, uh, claiming the right to, to asylum. Yeah, and of course there are other um, asylum seekers, we've just recently had a campaign called Refugee 2 where we were saying that there are lots of atheists uh, um, and ex-Muslims who also should be considered refugees like uh, Rahaf uh, Muhammad who was recently given refuge in, in Canada, so people like Muhammad Ali, people like uh, Aftab Ahmad and of course uh, Fasad Rizvi um, and the fact that you know um, they're not believed uh, they're told that you know they can live discreetly as atheists in countries where atheists are persecuted. And of course, in a way, when we look at it, the situation is even so much more worse in countries bordering places like Iran, like you know Turkey, Iraq, uh, where you know Iranian refugees, for example, are in the worst situation. They're not getting support from the UNHCR. And also, um, recently, the UNHCR has just put its hands up and said, we're not processing any more cases. Uh, uh, Go uh, to the Turkish government. Turkish government and get used to the situation of uh, uh, Turkey. Now, Turkey is an Islamist country. We know one hand in hands of the hands are in the uh, um, in Daesh camp and ISIS camp. We know very clearly that the, uh, the work with the I Iranian uh, um, government against the refugees and asylum seekers, the lives are in danger, and United Nations is collaborating with, uh, uh, with the government of Turkey and actually advising the asylum seekers to get used to the situation and, and uh, you know, to the situation um, and be compatible with the Turkish society. Where they've got no papers, where yeah. they can't work, where they can't go to school. I mean, what sort and of... So they don't have health care, they don't have any sort of... Uh, Absolutely, and, and so many of the Turkish uh, uh, authorities... Kids can't go to school, I'm sorry. Mm, okay. Refugee kids can't go to school. Six, seven years they're in Turkey. 
and uh, and the uh, Turkish officials are all Islamists now. You know, imagine atheist, uh, uh, ex-Muslim asylum seekers uh, uh, like Arsalan um, going and and presenting and trying to case make a case against Turk. You know, uh, in front of the Turkish officials. Imagine the sort of situation they're facing. And I think the United Nations. Uh, refugee agency in Turkey should be ashamed of itself. Yeah, and of course these are the uh, we should actually name some of the refugees that are um, uh, that that are in very serious conditions. They're atheists: uh, Arsalan Nejati, Iman uh, Iman Soleimani, Amiri, Amir and Mina Kalate, and also there's a, a woman called Basma who are in Turkey and who need safety and protection. The best thing to do uh, to end our segment is really to end with uh, Behruz Bouchani's words, words of resistance and humanity in the face of such brutality uh, that has been imposed on refugees in Ma Manus Island and other uh, surrounding islands uh, by the Australian government. When I arrived at Christmas Island six years ago, an immigration official called me into the office and told me that they we're going to exile me to Manus Island, a place in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I told them that I am a writer. That same person just laughed at me and ordered the guards to exile me to Manus. I kept this image in my mind for years, even while I was writing my novel. And even right now, as I am writing this acceptance speech, it was an act of humiliation. When I arrived in Manus, I created another image for myself. I imagined a novelist in a remote prison. Sometimes I would walk half naked beside the prison fences and imagine a novelist locked up right there in that place. This image was all inspiring. For years, I maintained this image in my mind, even while I was forced to wait in a long queues to get food or while enduring other humiliating moments. This image always helped me uphold my dignity and keep my identity as a human being. In fact, I created this image in opposition to the image created by the system. After years of struggling against a system that has completely ignored our individual identities, I am happy that we have arrived at this moment. This proves that words still have the power to challenge inhuman systems and structures. I have always said that I believe in words and literature. I believe that literature has the potential to make change and challenge structures of power. Literature has the power to give us freedom. Yes, it is true. I have been in a cage for years, but throughout this time, my mind has always been producing words. And these words have taken me across borders, taken me overseas and to unknown places. I truly believe words are more powerful than the fences of this place, this prison. This is not just a basic slogan. I am not an idealist. I am not expressing the views of an idealist here. These words are from a person who has been held captive on this island for almost six years. A person who has witnessed an extraordinary tragedy unfold in this place. These words allow me to appear there with you tonight. With humility, I would like to say that this award is a victory. It is a victory not only for us, but for literature and art. And above all, it is a victory for 
humanity, a victory for human being, human dignity. A victory against a system that has never recognized us as human being. It is a victory against a system that has reduced us to numbers. This is a beautiful moment. Let us all rejoice tonight in the power of literature.